Okay, we are now recording. Um, yeah, uh, hi everybody. Uh, welcome to this uh, talk with uh, Eustace Bauman. Eustace is a co-founder of Future Matters Project, which is an organization that helps citizen movements by um, building teams, developing strategies, and uh, spreading the I guess, strategies on how they can be more effective. And uh, today, Eustace will talk specifically about the role of social movements uh, as a crucial component in the climate fight and what makes the successful ones uh, successful and how they're different from those that are not, and uh, how Future Matters Project is using these insights to, to help other movements. Um, so this event is hosted by the workonclimate.org community. I think we might have attendees today from outside the community. So for, for those who are outside the community, uh, we, yeah, we are a Slack community that helps people pivot their careers into climate. Uh, we have a variety of programs uh, to that effect. Yeah, come join us uh, if you're serious about working on climate. Uh, I'm Eugene, I'm, I'm a co-founder of the community. Uh, I will just be playing the role of a facilitator here. And uh, a couple of last things before I hand over to, to Eustace. So one thing, uh, as I said, the event is recorded, uh, but also we will be taking notes in uh, this document. Let me check that this is the correct document. Yes, this is the correct document. Uh, so uh, yeah, I would really appreciate if uh, people could help collectively take notes there uh, because people who didn't attend the event usually find them really helpful to refer to later. And like we, um, yeah, oftentimes like somebody will join the community and say they're interested in something and then we can just point them to notes, which is more effective than to a recording. So that's one thing. Uh, and uh, also, um, we, um, if you want to submit questions uh, for the speaker, we will have the opportunity to submit them uh, just like live and ask them live this time. But generally, we also use this app called Slido for submitting questions and voting on them. There are a few questions already, so uh, feel free to use that. And uh, yeah, um, that's it with the intro, handing over to Eustace. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you for having this opportunity uh, to speak here. Um, so as Eugene said, today we will explore a bit like what role um, social movements might play in the climate fight um, and how they could become a lot more successful. So the title of this talk was why climate movements might be a game changer for climate protection. And I think Every time someone comes around and claims something could be a game changer, I personally am very skeptical, you know, because uh, for something to make like a such a great, great difference, uh, it has to be something like really special. Um, and I think climate change is an area where it's even harder to have something like a game changer um, because we know like greenhouse gas em emissions come from so many di different sectors. So we need change in numerous areas simultaneously. Uh, we basically need change of an unprecedented scale. Um, and this is a change that has to last for like basically decades, if not centuries. Um, and also all that needs to happen like really, really fast because we're running out of time. So um, basically, every kind of like approach um, what, that really wants to be something like a game changer would have to satisfy those cr four criteria. Change in num numerous areas, gr grand change of great scale. Um, it has to last for long and it has to happen really fast or at least that there has to be the chance that it happens really fast. So the question is, do social movements really fulfill these four criteria? And if yes, why? And I think for people who kind of have read a lot about climate change, who are working on climate change, uh, I think the riddle that we are all faced with is kind of like, why has so little happened until now? Um, and basically, I remember reading maybe like three years ago or so, a New York Times article that was called 40 years ago, we could have solved the climate crisis, which was about the emerging climate science there and how the threat of climate change was almost taken seriously, um, but then kind of abandoned as a topic. Um, so we could, we could be a lot further, um, but we aren't really. 
And of course, there are all kinds of like well-known problems. There's the free rider problem, cause and effect are really disconnected and so on. Um, so there are many reasons, but um, if we look into transformation, one thing uh, that comes up frequently is the question of policy supply and policy demand. Um, and what we see in the area of climate change is actually that there is a lot of policy supply or solution supply. So we have a lot of different ideas how we could address this challenge. Um, but what is really lacking also in this area, especially in the last decades has, has been missing um, is the creation of policy demand. So for something to get over this barrier of kind of like transformation, because transformation is always kind of like costly um, and kind of like not, not moving is always easier. And there will always be people who lose in any transformation. So for, for getting over that, you really need to build kind of like momentum. You need to create demand for, for this policy. It's basically like with like advertising in any area. It's not just like enough to have like a really good product. You also need to convince people that it's so good um, that that you should buy it. Um, and 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 also like the policy arena in some um, way works similar. And so what we might assume is that we have we have solutions, not solutions for everything, but we. Um, there would be tangible action, but what is kind of missing is, kind of, is the support that would be needed um, to get this kind of change implemented in the policy area, but maybe also like within businesses and so on. It's not just limited um, to, to politics. Um, and when we think about like policy demand creation, I think maybe the first thing um, we will think about is classical lobbying. Um, so basically just go do advocacy and so on. Um, but the reason why this has been tried but probably not been as successful as we hoped is um, it's an area where, for example, fossil fuel, uh, fossil fuel companies uh, have invested a lot and they're really, really good um at doing lobbying and so basically what we try to do there is kind of like try to beat an opposing power in the playing field where they have a systematic advantage okay so probably we will need more demand for the change that um that is necessary right now um and probably lobbying alone won't, won't solve this um so what other path is there to create policy demand and to build this momentum? Um, and to find an answer for that, um, we will take a brief di digression into the mechanics of power. And especially we will take a look at how Serbia overthrew their dictatorship. Um, so in Serbia um, for a long time, there was uh, actually pretty ruthless dictatorship in place uh, with Milosevic as the dictator. Um, and the, this kind of dictatorship seemed really stable. Um, but within a very short time and with very few people, only 80,000 of the around 6.5 million people in Serbia engaged, uh, the dictatorship was overthrown. And I mean, basically, this is like a very massive change or kind of like system change from dictatorship to democracy within a few months. And we can ask, like, how was that possible? Why was this movement called OTCO, meaning freedom in, in Serbian, so successful? And what they really focused on are the pillars of power. And here we will come to our like first very important kind of like um, characteristic uh, of what social movements are so good at and why they, uh, why they can create change really fast. And so 
when you look at the pillars of power, you basically ask yourself, who right now is upholding the status quo? And then you think, okay, who are the people in power who are kind of like upholding the status quo? And then you look at like, who is, um, who are they dependent on? Who, which support do they need from whom um, in order to stay in power and in order um, to uphold the status quo? And Otpor, this movement was really, really good at that. So they basically realized that uh, the dictatorship was really dependent on the support of police and military. And so when they got arrested, for example, they basically started to talk to the uh, policemen and women and to the military people about like the dictatorship in a way that would connect to the values of those people that would have like make them start question that um, this uh, dictatorship up to the point where actually after a few months um, when they organized mass protests in the capital actually the police started joining them um, and then helped to put in place the democratic system. So what can we learn from, from this successful movement? Basically, movements can coordinate those people that politicians most depend on. So any politician, especially in democratic system, but basically in any societal system, is dependent on the support of other people. No one can rule alone. And the people who are the power basis of those people in charge. I'm listening to um, a podcast. I'm trying to do finish the quote for the thing for tomorrow. Where it does anything. Why? You finished okay. work? Yeah, nearly, yeah. Okay, so there's some background noise, I think, right? What? 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 No. Okay, sorry, now we can continue. Okay, so what was the first really important insight? Movements can coordinate those people that politicians most depend on. Everyone in power is dependent on other people and what movements are really good at is, is organizing support within um, a broad basis of society. Uh, at least those movements that have explicitly focused on that. So they can kind of form a winning coalition among voters and people from different uh, influential institutions and social groups. Um, and especially this aspect of like organizing masses, not just a few people, but really the broad basis of power um, is something that, that makes movements so powerful. And what's really interesting and what I've learned from a lot of like um, conversations that I helped prepare with politicians in Germany is that politicians who are very sympathetic to your cause often ask for more protest and more pressure. Um, why? Because only if there's kind of like a cre credible threat to their power then they can make changes that others will dislike in the short term without losing their political agency. Um, so often you will have kind of like this so-called Overton window, which is basically this kind of like um, scope where, where you think like this is still something realistic that could happen um, and that you can voice without kind of like seeming crazy. Um, or radical or whatever it might be. Um, and a lot of politicians really depend on only being able to support publicly what they think will resonate with wider public and will not lead to them being perceived as radical or kind of like unreasonable or anything. So if movements can, can basically move this Overton window, can move the public perception of like what is supported um, and also can kind of like create pressure that then politicians can react to. Uh, it will kind of like open up new possibilities of change that haven't been possible before. Um, and 
So there are already kind of like two criteria in this, which is change in various areas, because if movements organize people from like different societal groups, from like different uh, occupational groups and so on, it will not only create pressure on the government, but also more and more people will have someone in their, in their kind of like social group who's actively talking about, for example, climate change, and then also get those people thinking what they might be able to do and so on. And all of a sudden you have like people in businesses talking about like the threat of climate change and what they can do and you have public like civil servants uh, talking about like climate change and so on and so on basically because of this mass organizing um they're able to social movements are able to spark change in a lot of areas um and also kind of like shift um the kind of like status quo what's currently supported uh, on a grand scale and now we can think like, okay, but like organizing kind of like all various groups of society and so on, that sounds like pretty tough and doesn't that take a lot of time? What about speed? So we kind of like spoke about like, okay, for anything that really can make a meaningful difference on climate change, it doesn't only have to be kind of like um, really broad and great in scale, but also has to be very fast. Um, and then we'll get to the kind of like phenomenon of preference falsification. Um, because what's really, really interesting, not only politicians often are kind of like publicly not really honest about what they think and what they would like to support, also people in general are. So basically we we'll all depend on like belonging to our like social tribes uh, especially kind of like far ago that was basically our basis for survival and people still have that really kind of like strong need for belonging and for basically not deviating too much from from their social group um and so what's really interesting is that people often will say what they think most other people think uh about a topic and not really what they're kind of like thinking in the back of their mind. Um, and one example of that is, for, uh, is Saudi Arabia and the question of uh, should um, women be allowed to work, should like, or do husbands think that their wives should work? And um, when, when asked kind of like what they would like publicly state um, I think around 70% or so of like uh, Saudi Arabian men are like, okay, I don't want that my wife works. Uh, and they also express that they think that most other men think that while when kind of like being asked anonymously, uh, actually a very broad ma a majority, I think like 80% or so said that they think it's totally fine that their wi wives work. So what we have here is a classic example of pluralistic ignorance. Um, most people kind of think they're alone and they're deviating um, kind of like view on a topic. Uh, well, actually probably the support like silently has already shifted. And um, this, is, this is something uh, that can really kind of like easily be harnessed. Also in like climate change, we see that like, um, so I don't know exactly the statistics for the US, unfortunately, but for Germany, it's true that for example, 80% of all conservative voters support ending or like shutting down all uh, um, fossil power plants until 2030. So this is ar around 10 years more ambitious than the current plan. And often the conservative party in Germany will tell like, oh yeah, it would be great if we kind of like uh, would do that faster, but the people don't support it. And also when a lot of like people ask kind of like publicly about their opinion on that, they will also say like, they don't think it's realistic and so on. Um, but actually, kind of like in the back of their minds, they already think differently. So what you then kind of like need 
this higher kind of like visibility um, of these kind of like positions which are deviating right now in society from kind of like the perceived status quo or what like normal people think um, and cause social tipping. Um, so most people actually kind of like will not even have like a strong opinion in the back of the mind, but they're rather passive. They have like other things to do. They have children to take care of, a new job that they need to find and so on. So they won't sit for hours like reading about climate change and making up their minds, but they basically will state and share what they kind of like have heard from others and what they think most other people think. And what social movements are really good at is kind of like creating norm entrepreneurs. So people who are kind of like uh, messengers for a social group um, who very openly express one specific view um, and by that kind of like signaling to others that this is actually what a lot of people uh, think right now or maybe even better to say more and more people are now starting to support this cause because that's like a, a dynamic social norm so-called which will often um, make people then active and move. So social movements are really good uh, at helping overcome preference falsification. Um, this kind of like wrong statement based on what, uh, what people think, most other people think, and by kind of like open, openly kind of like creating or like publicly creating an idea what mo most people think and by that um, creating pluralistic ignorance or even um, kind of like getting the support of those who are kind of like currently undecided, which is often like a great part of society. And so when this kind of like social tipping happens, um, uh, what is happening is this kind of like unleash effect. <coughs> All of a sudden, a lot of people become active. And that's something that we have seen uh, in a lot of Arabic countries uh, in the so-called Arabic sp spring. All of a sudden, there was this kind of like social tipping. People uh, believed that so many other people um, supported the uh, opposition against the dictatorship that they also started acting and kind of like it seemed all of a sudden in very little time um, there was this mass protest. Um, but so to activate this kind of like massive public support you need norm entrepreneurs but you also kind of like then need to do basically something with all those active people because only kind of like a brief uprising <laughs> or like one mass protest is most of the time not enough. But so what have we seen so far? By attracting people from all strands of society, social movements can, can create the power basis for grand transformation um, they can also change the idea of what most people think and what is kind of like normal to support. Um, and by kind of like causing the social tipping, changing what most people think, they can actually spark this change in great time. But now we kind of like look into kind of like recent history and think like, hmm, I can think about a lot of movements that have failed. Uh, are they, are they really so good as it sounds right now? Um, and one moment, one movement that stands out is actually Occupy. So let's talk a second why Occupy failed. Um, and actually Occupy could have been one of those kind of like historic, really successful movement, like the civil rights movement, the women, women's rights movement, or the uh, Indian independent independency movement because they had actually a great historic window of opportunity. There was this um, financial crisis, a lot of people thought like things had to change, there was broad popular support and they even were really smart to say like we are the 99%. So basically saying like okay we are kind of like 
the in-group we are most people so exactly doing this kind of like signaling this is what normal people think um thing and so that was actually really really good and um still we know occupy didn't really last they didn't create like a lot of change so what so what was missing um and there's one very prominent quote that kind of um shows us or like give, gives us a hint why this might not have um been so or like why it didn't became successful uh and that, that was well in 600 cities now we don't need a plan um and as i've said before popular support alone is not enough what you need then is to, to turn that popular support into effective political action and for that you basically need um people who can coordinate the movement and so on uh, you need kind of like strategists um you need people who can then locally organize action and so on so basically you need a lot of like organization building and you also need a very clear purpose and both was lacking in the case of occupy uh, and that's why occupy uh after some time just like lost its momentum um and kind of like disappeared basically um apart from like a few people who still camped um in a few areas and there's another movement which kind of like contrasts very nicely and showing like what even with a lack of broad pub popular support you can do if you are very strategic and you um, invest a lot in organization building um, and actually the civil rights movement is a great example of that so they they spend a lot of like time on building mass training structures to then also make sure there's enough capacity for massive pu public action they focus and they kind of like even purposefully created their own historic window of opportunity. So I think we all know about like the Montgomery bus boycott or maybe more prominently known as like the Rosa Parks pr protests. And what they actually did there is they for months thought about like what could be an action that would kind of like trigger a lot of other people to protest and who would be necessary uh, in order to get this change going. And they even uh, then kind of like casted a person um, to initiate this pr this protest. So it was like very strategic, very pre-planned, a lot of organization building. And they basically created their own historic window of opportunity. And what we see there uh, is that a, qu a quote from uh, the historian Yuval Noah Harari um, is really crucial uh, for, so for social movements, which is basically, do not ask yourself how many people would support your cause. Ask how many people can you actively organize to, to support your cause. And if we look at kind of like recent examples um, of like social movements, I think we have two very prominent ones um, in the USA. Uh, the Sunrise Movement and the Black Lives Matter Movement. I'm sure there are like more that I'm just like not aware of. Um, but there's actually really a really interesting analysis that I can share with you afterwards. Uh, those two movements activated a lot of like young voters to go voting in, sw in swing states and thus may have had a crucial role in actually getting Biden instead of Trump elected. So what we see is social movements throughout history have really kind of like changed the path of societies, where they are going, what is the new normal, and so on. They have, in some cases, when they were well organized, they have been able to really um, activate this broad public support, support also from those people that the kind of like current people in power are most dependent on. They've been able to change social norms and, and they have been able to do that very fast 
and often once the social norm was changed, for example, about like women should be able to vote or should should have the right to vote, uh, these norms have been then quite stable and now are kind of like very hard, if not impossible, to kind of like uh, overthrow again. And so social movements aren't a magic fix, but they are kind of like a magnifier of everything else that needs to happen. They're kind of a catalyst for change. And this is why I and also two friends of mine have, have started the Future Mass project. And what we have observed is there's a lot of social movements who kind of like know what change is necessary in the world, but they don't really know much about how change is happening or how change works and especially what makes social movements successful. And we have looked quite a lot into kind of like the success and failure factors of social movements. And so what we try to do is disseminate those kind of like principles of how movements become successful and very kind of like tangible actions about like what you can do in order to make a movement successful to the current climate movements. Um, and we have started that in Germany and Actually, the For Future movement in Germany is the biggest social movement uh, in German history and also one of the biggest climate movements globally. And Germany is really one of those countries. Basically, if Germany changes its position on climate, then you will also get a new majority in favor of like stronger climate protection um, in the Council of Ministers, um, in the European Union, and that or like might get got a majority not very clear and also depends on the policies, but basically this will have a huge impact also on the EU policy. And then you can have like a really tangible effect on like uh, the global economy. So it's probably one of those leverage points. Uh, that's like one of the reasons why we started there apart from that being the country that we are from. Um, but what are we doing exactly? So dissemination of the principles, how like social movements become successful sounds great, um, but kind of like more, more concretely, what, what are you doing? Um, so we have three basically trainings uh, on movement success. The first one is organizing. How you, can you basically um, activate new influential societal groups? How, how can you find opinion leaders in these groups, how can you connect the cause of climate protection to their values um, and how can you make it easier for them then again to, to convince kind of like their, their peers uh, to start supporting this cause. Um, and then the second training is on um, how you can organize internally, how do you deal with conflict, how do you deal with mistakes. Um, how can you build trust around a common purpose? Um, and also like kind of like, how can you split up in small teams and so on that, uh, so the costs of coordination don't get too high. Um, and then the third training series is on uh, political strategy and effective political action. Again, based on um, our understanding of like, what, what are some of the kind of like uh, leverage points for political action uh, in the political system of Germany. Um, and basically, if we have trained people in like these three areas, then we can attract a lot of new people to this movement. Um, they are organized well internally, and then they do things which are effective in, in sparking change. And of course, if we would do that all on our, on our own, in this uh, kind of like small team, we wouldn't get far. So what we do is we uh, make those training series highly scalable, easy to learn, quite robust, um, and so on. Um, and so we can teach those to others basically on with like a trainer trainers model. So this kind of like snowball principle. Uh, kind, kind of system where you like teach others how to teach others um, the, um, 
these kind of lessons and uh, do so in a way that like with each new training, like a percentage, a percentage of those people will then also become like trainers uh, and some of them will train new trainers and so on. So you basically have this kind of like self magnifying system where the kind of like number of people who are actively trained uh, can grow exponentially. And we try to do that in a way that kind of like the whole system that we're building is integrated in the social movement, like in the climate movement directly. So after some time it can function independently from us and we can focus on like new countries, other movements and so on. And basically the question there is like, is that something like totally new? Isn't kind of like 350.org or so already doing that? Uh, of course, no, we, we don't have invented something like totally new. Um, what we probably have done is like uh, just taking a lot of like different areas, like scalable service design and how can you kind of like create um, service models that can grow exponentially um, the insights from behavioral sciences. So it's like the training is only as good as the action it sparks. So I think we all have been in like a workshop where we learned interesting things and then we walked out into the world and didn't do much with it. So we are really tracking kind of like the number of behavior changes um, that, that we have caused. Um, and then also re really looking into kind of like not just a few examples, but really trying to look into the research on like how movements become successful, really looking into what is needed right now in this situation and so on. So basically what we try to do is in, in each field that we think is helpful, find kind of like the very best models that we see and then combine them to something that's probably in this combination, new and helpful um, to support the climate movements. Um, and what we basically think with that, if we can grow the capacity of movements to attract new, new supporters, organize them, and then communicate well, strategize well, then we can build grand momentum, which will, in Germany, before the national election, then um, mobilize a lot of people to say like, okay, this time I will make kind of like dependent for which party I'm voting, on their kind of like uh, promises when it comes to climate action. Um, we can activate new people to actually go talk to politicians and say like, okay, if you want to get reelected, what, what exactly will you do? We can get like business leaders um, to, to act um, and to kind of like change their, their strategy um, when it comes to their own business and so on. Uh, and we had like a number of successes with that in the past, like um, basically members of parliament forming new groups, pushing their own party uh, for stronger regulation on climate. Um, one, one of the parties, the Green Party is explicitly changing their kind of like um, policy goal from like two degrees to 1.5 degrees and stating that this was due to the pressure from the climate movements and so on. So we do hope that in the coming months, kind of like scaling those programs, we will be able to make a meaningful contribution to changing Germany's position on climate. Thank you. I hope it has been interesting so far. <laughs> this was probably quite a ride. Um, and now I'm really interested in hearing about your questions. And sorry if there have been messages in the chat <laughs> that I haven't read in the meantime. Yeah, thanks Eustace. Uh, this, was, uh, this was fantastic. Uh, let, me, let me now switch to presenting the, um, the questions. Just a moment, I uh, need to go to that. Okay, so it's prefer preference falsification, by the way, I'm just reading the, <laughs> the messages in the chat. Um, so basically, 
people stating another like a preference other than their true preference. Mm -hmm. And yeah, pluralistic ignorance, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay. So uh, the uh, our first question is: Are there technology tools or platforms we could build to help movement organizers be more effective? Like there are tools for projects managers. Can there be tools for movement organizers? Okay. Um, so there there are actually a few um, tools already, like Nation Builder, for example, um, and also. Basically, for our like scaling, we just use like very simple kind of like sales technology uh, software like Airtable mm -hmm. to kind of like track uh, this. Um, so I so from like what I know, uh, I think most of the software solutions that I've already developed also do work or kind of like movements, or there are even a few software solutions specifically uh, for movements. But um, I'm sure if you kind of like ask people who are more active in, or kind of like who are like more directly engaged into like everyday activism, they uh, will have like some kind of like needs uh, that I'm not aware of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I wonder if this question is asking about whether uh, you think there are tools that like take advantage of the insights that you guys are taking advantage of, you know, maybe tools that <laughs> large organizers towards doing it the right way, like a, the scalable way, like training the trainers, measuring impact and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so also we, we take a look at like, okay, which like elements of like our training is like sparking um, kind of like uh, the most action, what is missing, kind of like which kind of like train like in what way do we need to train people so that they are kind of like most effective and so on. So we, we kind, of, uh, kind of try to do like very data driven, um, but um, so far, fortunately we have always been able to find like uh, a software that can, can do that for us. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I mean, I really appreciate that there's this community and uh, that there are people who are kind of like willing to help and support, yeah. Makes sense. Okay, um, next question. What are climate movements usually most bottlenecked by? Is it uh, like demand from, I guess, the people they're trying to activate or money or organizer skill or something else? Okay, so from my per perception, um, well, what we see also with a lot of successful movements is actually that they had um, a small team of organizers kind of like in the back, which had stable operational funding. Um, so one case that's probably a bit more campaigning than social movement building, um, but uh, kind of like exemplifies um, what is also true for other movements um, is the same-sex marriage referendum in Ireland, which was basically something no one thought of as possible. Uh, and then all of a sudden this more conservative Catholic country was uh, voting in favor uh, of the same-sex mar marriage. And uh, what was the case there is that uh, a few foundations uh, decided to trust basically a few movement builders um, to give them money for five years and then say like, okay, so you don't have to kind of like stay in this kind of like project death cycle that most kind of like organizations are in where you always kind of like need, need to come up with something new uh, to get like kind of like your funding for the next um, six months. But we give you funding for five years um, and you can just like really concentrate on this kind of like organization building in the background on like, um, building this broad support um, over time. And so this is something like there's like, or like these kind of groups of like a few people building this kind of like backbone uh, have been present with a lot of successful movements. And this is something that I think a lot of social movements are limited by because most foundations um, only are willing to give kind of like um, funding on a project basis um, so more short term um, and this kind of like investment into kind of like longer term change that 
um, has been very present, for example, with kind of like the conservative revolution in the US or also the neoliberal movement with like Thatcher in the UK is something that is uh, mostly missing uh, in kind of like the more progressive er area of the funding landscape. Yeah, that's, that's really helpful. Thanks. Um, okay. The next question is, um, yeah, reducing food waste is a drawdown solution that is, uh, I guess, the most important one for U.S. households. And uh, yeah, Mary is asking to talk about how we might build a social movement around that. Okay, so <laughs> I'm afraid I won't come up with kind of like the perfect blueprint uh, <laughs> from the top of my head. Um, but uh, Often what you look at is kind of like the spectrum of supporters. So you basically ask uh, who's already infused about this and would be kind of like kind of like ready to commit and support. And then you try to think like, okay, who's this, for example, in the US? How can I kind of like, where do I meet a lot of those people and how can I organize them? So the active supporters. Um, then you can kind of look, okay, who's someone who kind of like might be a passive supporter? Uh, so people who kind of like generally like the idea, but aren't really active yet and haven't really planned to become active. And this will be kind of like the second group that you would start with kind of like next. And um, then you go to kind of like uh, passive op opposition and like last you would try to organize like the active opposition. And another kind of like principle for kind of like movement building is uh, being outwards, outward facing. So basically, if you gain new supporters, those are the people who are kind of like, haven't become kind of like totally um, integrated in your community yet or in your movement yet. And so they don't have kind of like the language and sometimes the social traits, which will make um, them probably a bit kind of like strange to people kind of like outside. So if you're like in a long time for a social movement, you kind of like may become ignorant that there are people who think differently than you. Um, so if you take those people who are just starting to become your supporters and tell them, okay, the first action that you can do is kind of like bring two friends, kind of like talk now to, to, the, to, to your friends. Uh, this is often a great way to kind of like build a mass movement growing on the fringes. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Yeah, that's that's a really interesting idea that uh, like the people you should ask to engage others are the new supporters because they still remember what it's like not to be one. Right? Exactly. <laughs> and this is actually one thing that a lot of social movements are doing wrong. They think like, okay, the people who are kind of like most active that are, uh, are best at recruiting new members because they kind of like know all about kind of like the cause and so on. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Um, okay. The next question is, given climate is complex, the solutions are complex, and what's the ask of a movement? Uh, yeah, I'm not quite sure what this means, perhaps, uh, like, yeah. yeah. I'm actually not but, quite I, but I think actually having like climate kind of like clear goals or like a clear ask is really important. And so what we usually advise uh, social movements is that um, look for a target that, that is kind of like a leverage point to kind of like uh, sparking a lot of like change. And so one of the kind of like goals that we propose for climate movements usually are binding reduction targets. So kind of like try to push Germany for committing to become climate, neut climate neutral until 2035. Because once this is kind of like in the law and there are also kind of like um, penalties for kind of like not meeting this goal, especially if that's something like Germany starts to push for that on the European level and then it's decided there, it will be very hard to kind of like reverse that. And if you have this kind of like goal of a binding reduction target, this will kind of like then basically just necessitate a change on a lot of other areas in order to meet that goal. Mm -hmm. um, so, so this is often having these kind of like proxy goals, which, which then kind of like create a lot of like change dynamics uh, is, is a good kind of like um, target in a kind of like with a complex problem and complex solutions um, and so on. So basically, even though like solutions are 
complex. Uh, the movement organizers and movement members like do not need to be like experts on solutions. The goals are less complex and they need to just push for the goals. Exactly. And of course, uh, I just saw the question in, in the chat, for example, mm -hmm. you always need to ask kind of like, um, what is kind of like possible in the political system that I'm kind of like active in, for example, in Germany, there's, there's this kind of like uh, opportunity to kind of like have maybe uh, a government right now which is supporting a binding reduction target on the European level. And then even if we get like a different government kind of like the next term um we still have this binding reduction uh, target so there's the eu which is uh, able to enforce this uh, in the context of the us there may, may be something different uh, which will kind of like create this kind of like force of change mm -hmm. makes sense thank you the next question is um, what learnings from sparking social movements translate to sparking corporate movements Oh, what a wonderful question. And I, because I do think that corporate movements will be a very kind of like important part um, of kind of like the grander climate movement. Uh, and actually, uh, I just came across a recent example of the biggest producer of glass in Germany, which is also uh, has one of the greatest kind of like total emissions of all corporations in Germany, which just committed to um, a reduction target of becoming, or even a climate neutrality tar target of becoming climate neutral until 2030. So basically 20 years before kind of like the official goal of climate neutrality uh, of Germany right now, uh, after being pushed a lot from the employees um, of, this, um, of this company. And also in corporate movements, uh, it's I think very similar actually to social movements, basically ask like who would have the power to change this? And then ask who are kind of like the peers of those people who are able to change this? And maybe even ask who are kind of like the people even one bound lower to who would be able to change this? So basically it's unlikely that you directly will kind of like change the CEO. And it's more likely that you will kind of like change the mind of someone who then changes the mind of someone who's the friend of the CEO, for, mm -hmm. for example. So people are changed by their peers. Um, and then again, you ask kind of like on this lower bound, uh, who are the people who are already actively supporting it? Then I can ask like, how can I make this kind of like um, less difficult or like kind of like less risky to support in this, uh, to support this? basically looking at like, okay, what might stop people um, fr from kind of like uh, participating uh, in, this, in this corporate movement. So making clear what it's not about, for example, if they're kind of like afraid of something um, and then kind of like organize the, the passive support or the active supporters and the passive supporters of the lower bounds, make them kind of like talk to the next kind of like um, level in this funnel and so on until you get to kind of like the corporate uh, leadership. I think that, that would in general be my idea. And I think one kind of like um, tool from communication psychology is often building a golden bridge for people to change their mind. So assuming that you haven't been someone who's has been like super worried about climate change all your life, you can basically talk about like how you were kind of like ignorant to that problem, for example, then you came across something and then you kind of like realized how important it is. And now you're kind of like acting uh, on this. So, so basically show people that it's not like you who always knew it all, who now tries to teach this other person um, what they should think by more saying like, okay, I've been someone who hasn't been really aware of that, this uh, for some time. Uh, learned about it and now I think it's like really important and I was wondering um, if you would be willing to support this. Mm -hmm. I, I think this question might be actually asking about one of two things. It's I think you addressed one of them which is movements within a corporation. The other mm -hmm. is uh, like movements where the members of the movement are corporations. Okay. <laughs> uh, but yeah. Um, I think even even then it's probably interesting to say like okay who's kind of like the corporation which is kind of like closest to you 
mm -hmm. um, where, where you already have like kind of like strong re relationships with. And uh, I think what's really interested with both countries and, co and corporations um, is the idea of kind of like uh, conditional commitments. So basically saying like, if I get 10 people or like if I get 10 corporations, if I get 10 countries to sign this pledge, um, would you be then willing to be one of the people who could, or like one of the corporations that commits? So this is like a way to kind of like overcome this like collective action problem where everybody doesn't want to kind of like be the first one to act. So if you say like, okay, you only need to act if I find like 10 other people that are or like 10 other corporations that also commit to action and you are only number four right now and that was like one of the kind of like approaches that we used to form these kind of like uh, party internal groups of members of parliament and we basically asked like various members of parliament for a conditional commitment and then we had like 15 members of parliament who who said they would they would support uh a stronger reduction target, for example, and only then we made it public. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Yeah, that's a, that's a powerful tool. So uh, we are almost at the end, but the next two questions seem really interesting. So let's uh, let's maybe tackle them together. Uh, oh, sorry. I, I, well, I clicked them wrong. Uh, I clicked the wrong button. But basically, the questions were asking, like, how do you measure uh, how do you measure the impact of a movement? Uh, you said that you pay a lot of attention to to that. Yeah. Um, so I think pro probably like in three stages, uh, the first one is kind of like um, degree of kind of like popular support for this movement, kind of like what percentage of the population is supporting that movement and is this growing, like what's the growth rate of that, uh, because often what you see is there's like a long time where movements are kind of like growing but don't have impact yet, and it's I think very important to kind of like not write them off as like you haven't achieved anything so far. Mm -hmm. Then I think policy impact kind of like are they able to kind of like change kind of like tangible rules and regulations. Mm -hmm. um, and then the next stages would be basically changing kind of like party programs. So kind of like the position of political actors and the kind of like last stage then would be kind of like a shift in kind of like social norms, the public idea. Uh, or the so-called Overton window. Uh, so that would be kind of like the four stages of movement success. Makes sense. Okay, uh, thank you. Yeah, there are a number of other fascinating questions, but we're at the end of our time slot. So I'm going to like uh, transition to the outro, I guess. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for this talk. Uh, this, this was excellent. And uh, um, yeah, last uh, reminder, like we have a time honor tradition in the community that uh, uh, after events, we request that people share something they learned uh, on the channel, share your path. Uh, I'm going to quickly create a thread there where you can do that. Um, yeah, this is uh, in the spirit of, I guess, being uh, more action oriented than uh, just like passively watching an event. It's important to be engaged and you will remember more from that if you share something you learned. Yeah. Um, thanks so much, Eustace. Uh, yeah. Thank you all. I hope this was somehow helpful and informative. <laughs> and I hope you all have a great day. Thank Thanks, you. Bye. Bye. Bye.